Necromunda is one of the Imperium's most infamous hive worlds. Planets whose industrial output, while technologically nothing even approaching that of a forge world of the Adeptus Mechanicus, nevertheless fuels the Imperium's unappeasable appetite for manufactured goods. The mountainous, towering city conglomerates iconically pierced the toxic atmosphere, containing within their armored shells teeming, cramped billions of souls, their lives short, miserable and expendable, spent in toil, subservient only to production quotas and the lash of their bosses. Should the citizens reject this life, they may throw their lot in with the gangs and outcasts of the world, criminal underworld elements seeking riches or other more sinister aims. The society of Necromunda is relatively characteristic of hive worlds. No real effort is made to implement any form of true administration upon the entire population. Such a thing is functionally impossible as it is, admittedly, throughout the Imperium itself. Instead, Necromunda, like many hive worlds, applies a microcosm of the galactic Imperial system, a form of feudal society wherein individuals owe loyalty to others higher up the proverbial chain, all the way to the anointed Imperial House of the Planetary Governor. This form of urban feudalism is typically quite self-policing. Weaker clans naturally seek the protection of more powerful neighbors, whose power is checked by others on a similar societal level. From there, canny operators can skew the balance of power this way or that, all ensuring that the production of the world and the tithe to the Imperium remains on time and of the correct exacting quantities. Within this structure, the famed clan houses of Necromunda play a crucial role. Know then that this is a record of one such household, not sinister coteries of shadows and whispers, they who claim to speak for a voice too terrible to name. The House of Shadows, the Delac. House Delac of all the major clans that rule the Necromundan Underhives, possess scant little in the form of a defined household or power base. Unlike the Goliath, Escher, Van Sar, or Orlok, they possess no monopoly over a clearly defined production, economic role, or industrial sector. And unlike Cawdor, they do not claim a cohort of faith or ideologically bound herds. To the masses of the population of Hive Primus, one could pose the question of what precisely it is the House of Shadows does, and receive any one of a myriad of answers. They are spies, they are assassins, they are information brokers. These are all, by and large, truths, yet falsehoods at the same time. As with all good lies, there are contained within the scraps of greater truths. For instance, the Delac do absolutely traffic in information, and profitably. Those that can afford the exorbitant prices of their brokers are few, but are well aware of the quality product they will receive. Indeed, this is likely their most valuable service. They provide a connection to the Imperial House of Lord Helmore. That link, however, is subject to even more rumors. Depending on whom you inquire with, the Delac or anything from a bastard offshoot of the Imperial House to its eyes and ears in the Greater Hive. They are formidable fighters, assassins of note, saboteurs of unerring instinct. Yet none of these skills are offered out as mercenarial. Instead, every effort the House makes is apparently in service to some occluded agenda, a hidden purpose known only to the sinister pale scions of the Delac. 
Perhaps even more mysterious are the clan's territories. Unlike their contemporaries, the Dalak do not daub their sigils upon the various domes, tunnels, and doors of the Underhive, nor proudly proclaim their intents to govern this facility or that. They do not dwell in the tumble-down outskirts like House Goliath, or the rancid sumps of Cordor, or the finer inner reaches, the artifice houses of Vansar. Should one pose a question as to where the Dalak may be found, the best one can hope for is a hurried, furtive response that the clan is simply around. The House of Shadows' near invisibility does wonders for their reputation. The Dalak have become consummate professionals of appearing precisely when and where they want to. Should they have business, their presence will be known at the precise time they deem it necessary, and once it is concluded, they will seemingly vanish without a trace. Should the strict possession of territory be deemed necessary by the clan, they will, where possible, work through a chain of proxies, their involvement discernible usually only by the resources the scabby, run-down hivers suddenly possess to enact their agenda far beyond habitual means. To the canny, and that is to say, alive members of the Underhive's population, this is as clear a mark of House of Shadows activity as any Orlock banner or Cawdor fane. Many an enemy has torn apart a segment of the Hive searching for the Dalak, but to no avail. One may as well be chasing the shadows cast by dinoral glow globes. The sheer inscrutability of the clan has naturally led to many a rumor developing surrounding their origins and nature. Generally speaking, it is accepted across the hives that, as with their contemporary clan houses, the Dalak are little more than a variant of human society as it exists on Necromunda, possessing a curious but ultimately explicable doctrine emphasizing subterfuge. Their apparent penchant for bodily modification is nothing precisely new. The Imperium, of course, exists in tandem with the Empire of the Adeptus Mechanicus, whose quest for bodily transmogrification outstrips the Dalak by orders of magnitude. Indeed, even their contemporaries in House Goliath share such desire for modification. To those who inquire further into their nature, many come to believe the clan to be foreigners to Necromunda. Their bodily presentation shares aspects commonly seen amongst natives of night worlds, or starfaring folk. Perhaps the original Dalak bloodlines were imported by one of the noble houses up hive. Uh, the sheer otherworldliness of their visage has ever prompted accusations of Xenos origins, a theory which has, at times, brought the attention of Imperial agents to Necromunda. By all accounts, biologists, assayers, or even interrogators from the Holy Ordos have been ultimately placated. Gene sequencing provided by the Dalak has been successful in assuaging the luminaries of His Imperial Majesty's realm that they are, in fact, human to an acceptable baseline degree. Upon one's own investigation, it appears that two facts are truly known about the House of Shadows, although it may also be the case that these are lies repeated often enough as to gain the guise of truth. The first is that all Dalak share an innate connection and can communicate silently and from great distances with others of their clan. The second is that they are beholden to a group known as the Silent Ones. Both of these facts have, as with other scant information surrounding the clan, led to a further deluge of rumors. The silent communication they apparently share has led to whispers, naturally, that they are psychers, perhaps a genetic experiment of the noble houses that ended in failure, only to be dumped en masse into the Underhive. As mentioned, the Xenos rumors still persist. To some, the Dalak are aliens in the skins of humans, stalking Imperial society brazenly and openly, preying upon the unsuspecting of the Underhive. Yet others say they are a devolved strain of some sort of parasite, 
a creature from the sump that has burrowed into the necks of men and women and puppets them around. The strangest tale, however, relates to the fall of the drowned empire. As the myth spins, the Delac were present on Necromunda far, far before the first human dove the first colony ship onto the world's surface. Whatever title and form they may bear now, they did not then. They were wholly different in those ancient days. According to this tale, the planet that would become Necromunda was a world of water, and those great oceans had within them an ecosystem on a gigantic scale. Vast cyclopean beasts plied the darkest depths, monsters in all but name. So great and terrible were they that the lesser creatures of the world, beings of rudimentary sentience, worshipped them as deities. It was from these pathetic beasts that the first of the Delac were to be created. After thousands of years of rule by the monstrous gods of the dark oceans, the world sea began to wither. No real reason is given for this. Perhaps a comet impact was to blame, fluctuations in the system's sun, or, as some of the more poetic legendary strands put it, those great aquatic gods were simply drinking the oceans in their bottomless greed. The pathetic beasts of the planet knew that death was coming. They began to die with it, parched of moisture, writhing in agony. And soon, this mortality came champing at the heels of their great and terrible gods. The wretch things that would one day become the Delac could not surrender themselves to extinction, nor allow their gods to share this same fate. And so they devised a plan. They wrought in their desperation great underground seas, created deep within the crust, near the very heart of the world's core. The Delac, as one will simply refer to them here on in, built a mighty metropolis for their gods in these underground oceans, a respite wherein the terrible beasts could rest in a great slumber. Having bade their deities sleep far from the hateful gaze of the horrid sun, the Delac rose once more to the surface, having devised their own means to endure. And then, with the rest of what passed for sentience upon this world, they died. Many upon Necromunda, in hearing this tale for the first time, will usually state its impossibility as proven by one thing, the very idea that Necromunda ever had, at any point, oceans. Many, of course, cannot comprehend such a body of water to begin with, and even those that have ventured outside the confines of the Hive Cities confidently state that the barren ash wastes of the planet show no signs of ever seeing the merest drop of moisture. Likewise, the idea that below the surface there could exist a body of water of any significant size is simply ludicrous. Anyone who is anyone knows that below human habitation lies the sump and its runoffs, putrid sludge and industrial effluvia, a slurry of toxic lethality. Frequently, the telling of the tale will end here, as the bar table it is being told over descends into argument over what an ocean is, and if such a thing is even possible. Should it continue, however, the timeline moves significantly forward, millions of years forward into the future, into our past, when humanity first settled the world. Exploiting its rich mineral resources, humans raised mighty cities and factorums, and used the last of the world's oceans in their machines, all the while not knowing that the planet they trod upon had known the tread of other sentience before them. For thousands of years, the industry flourished, and the population fed to its hunger swelled, but the technology of man wrought a paradise upon the surface of the world, 
grasslands and forests, nurtured by the hands of man, bloomed, bringing a green vastness to a world that had never known such bounty. And for a time, it was good, until all fell to ruin and strife. An age of eternal night befell the world, as it, along with thousands of other human realms, were sundered from each other, falling into the darkness of the Age of Strife. Cities burned and millions died. The verdant forests and plains became unto scorched ash and howling deserts. The air itself was rendered poisoned so that few things could live outside the confines of the remaining hives. And beneath the strife and tumult, the ancient gods of the sea slept. Yet further thousands of years passed, and society as it had structured in the imperial era began to form. Much more millennia further ground on, and yet now, in modern Necromunda, there came the first true Delac. Millennia before the era Indomitus, there came unto the hives a great plague. This was not a sickness of the body, but of the mind. People from across the hives became ill with dreams, feverish visions filling their selves, drawing them away from their houses and their jobs. The dreams bore these individuals to the depths of the underhive, humans drawn from all stations and strata of society, coming together underneath the world. They all, apparently, now knew each other. The dreams that had summoned them had been sent through time and space, delivered by the great beasts beneath the earth. In the lightless abyss, the silent ones had breached the skine of linear chronology and made new children to do their bidding. The old and terrible gods of the world had servants anew. They had no voice save their memories, yet they spoke now, and they spoke through House de Lac. Many have, and to an extent quite rightly, scoffed at this origin myth. Lurid beyond even the aggrandizing legends of the clan houses of Necromunda, it is also deeply heretical. The idea of gods besides that of the Emperor we should not countenance them. It has also been challenged by other, at least somewhat more plausible, explanations. One of these states that they are the offspring of a lost, first Necromundan colony, a human offshoot mutated by their existence on the planet before proper colonization. Another states that they are the remnants of the usurped former Imperial House, House Aranthus, while another conflicts this stating that the Delac are the bastards of the current ruling house Helmor, a psychic experiment by imperial governments run amok. None of the explanations have any actual basis in fact. Many are supposition based on the appearances and activities of the House of Shadows. And, of course, the Delac themselves have no interest in providing any information upon the matter. It seems to one's mind that the sinister clan house inherently profits from rumors surrounding their origins, all the better to keep their opponents on edge, wrong-footed and chasing ghosts. The 36th millennium is commonly given as the root origin for the modern iteration of House de Lac by chroniclers on Necromunda, following the passage of the Dream Plague one mentioned earlier. This event was the only verifiable part of the legend of the Silent Ones. Whatever the actual cause of the psychic phenomena, it did, in fact, verifiably exist. As with all the major clan houses, the Delac's beginnings were ones of fits and starts, slowly establishing a power base in the underhive of Hive Primus. Unlike their contemporaries, however, they did not use guns or coin to build this foundation or at least not liberally. Rather, the Delac convinced others to support them. They appeared to possess an uncanny ability to sway minds 
with all but a few well-placed and well-timed words, leading naturally to whispers that they were employing malefic psychana. In reality, these examples are far more likely to be the result of diligent and careful information brokering. The Underhive is a vast conglomeration of constantly shifting alliances, deals, betrayals, blackmails, and feuds. Through this web, the Delac rose, seamlessly integrating themselves into the information economy of the Underhive and becoming a vital resource for whomever had the coin or the clout to treat with them. What individuals had made the connection between the rise of the Delac and those people lost to the plague of dreams passed from the world, and Necromunda soon forgot that they had questions of how exactly this new House of Shadows had risen, questions lost to the ceaseless grind of industry, productivity, and explosively lethal gang violence. The Clan House of Avarest became one of the first big targets for the rising Delac. Having survived the Two-Faced War, a civil war within Imperial House Helmore that had drawn in so many of the powerful entities within the Hive, House Avarest played a central role in re-establishing the ghast trade for the rebuilding Imperial Household. The psychotropic narcotic is one of the most profitable and dangerous substances on Necromunda. Derived from decayed, reconstituted corpse starch, the drug is not only a formidable narcotic experience, but can awaken psychic talents hitherto buried. The Delac aimed to seize this trade from Avarest, but did not intend to do so in the manner that, say, House Goliath would. By the beginning of the 38th millennium, Agents of the clan house were infiltrating Avarest actively, beginning to turn the rival clan upon itself. More and more, senior figures within Avarest made decisions utterly contrary to their nature and judgment, divesting their holdings to outside parties, all of whom, naturally, were proxies for the Delac. Where Avarest clanners could not be swayed, they simply disappeared replaced by successors who were far more amenable to the ongoing reorganization. House Avarest did not perish by fire and gunshots. They bled, decaying and collapsing, shambling forwards with bits and pieces of themselves falling off, until, slowly, the overwhelming majority of their operation had been utterly subsumed into the shadowy clutches of House Delac. As their reach grew, the Delac themselves began to change, physically. They became as they are commonly known now, pale, hairless, and favoring muted, concealing clothes. The sheer distrust in their motives, and this fairly radical shift in appearance, led naturally to Imperial House interest and investigation, lest a warp taint be consuming the Underhive. In late M38, matters came to a head when Vortus Hephrum, the so-called last free lord of Avarest, called in every favor he had to bring down the full scrutiny of not just the Imperial House, but the Adeptus Terra as well, upon House Delac. Unfortunately for Vortus, the just crusade he has envisaged did not quite play out as intended. Opposing him, there formed a ragged alliance of entirely willing clan houses, bounty hunters, hired guns, and religious extremists, all of whom were apparently prepared to wage war upon House Avarest on behalf of House Delac. The sheer range of opponents that faced down Vortus's army have led many chroniclers of this most famous of hive worlds to speculate that a deal had most surely been struck between the Imperial House and House Delac during this period. The desired enforcer brigades simply never materialized. Vortus was forced to use his ragtag and constantly at odds forces to run around the Underhive, chasing smoke and shadow, persistently falling into ambushes and continually 
monumentally failing to achieve any of his aims. History does not record Vortus' final fate, although it does record the fall of House Avarest in the wake of his disappearance on one of his operations. According to the chroniclers of House Helmore, their records speak of the decline of Avarest, a failure of its leaders, persistent and disconcerting worker uprisings, rampant sabotage, and other calamitous, unlucky events that befell them. The selfsame records notes that House Delac stepped in to save their holdings, deftly re-establishing production quotas and stabilizing the ire of the worker populations. Imperial House Chronicles, of course, say nothing of precisely how the Delac came to acquire them. For all the world, the utter destruction of House Avarest by House Delac reads as little more than a tidy business takeover in the aftermath of gross incompetency and ill fortune. For almost 3,000 years, House Delac has held its place within Necromunda. None of the other clan houses fully ken what their goals are. They merely know that there is something deeply unnatural about House Delac and how they chose to comport themselves. Ever is the House of Shadows content to play its own games. When House Orlok delved too deep within the spoil of Necrobunda, uncovering terrible things best left forgotten, House Delac conducted an active trade in the rare and dangerous objects Orlok's folly uncovered, seeing them into the hands of those that would bring them into new, terrible life. When the redemption consumed House Cawdor and put its sorry people on a path that would surely lead to their own annihilation, House Delac offered aid to pilgrims attempting to join the ragged hosts of the fiery faithful. When House Vansar and House Escher labeled to create the Goliaths, House Delac contented itself to watch, freely allowing Escher and Vansar to create their own doom. The House of Shadows has been present at a great many of the planet's most pivotal events in the last millennia, always appearing to be more informed as to what is going on than even the participants. House Delac elements apparently vanished from Necromunda's Hive Secundus not days before it was consumed in the atomic fire deployed to rid it of a gene stealer infestation. At the fall of Hive Arcos, they were amongst the few to survive the coming of the Lord of Skin and Sinew. Rumors abound as to whether the house was in league with, or opposed to, the many enemies of Necromunda that have sought the world's ruin. The Delac have been known to oppose the massive tribes that dwell within the Ash Wastes, as well as the workings of the Immortal Cult, a pathetic, cretinous group of Covenites worshipping the Lord of Change. And they have led expeditions into the Sump in order to put down mutant uprisings. The appearances of the House of Shadows in any such conflict is usually at a pivotal moment in an attempt to tip the scales, either for their own purposes, or, sometimes, purposes that seemingly align with that of Lord Helmore. Even incidents like the Ashline Heist, where the Orlok stole a vital maglev train shipment from the Delac, breaking their contract with House Ulanti and sparking a war between the two clan houses, are bogged down with myth and supposition. Did House Orlok truly win a great victory against the Delac, as they had believed, or was it, as it is rumored, merely the first step on the road that led to the Drypus incident centuries later, which saw the Imperial House publicly censor House Orlok, while clandestinely working its way into the debt of the Delac. All that can be said for certain is that the House of Shadows, while not persistently having linear progress in their history, have maintained a steady hand on power. Forgoing the calamitous falls or shocking sharp rises that have consumed and ruled so many other clan houses like them in favor of a steady growth and inscrutable goals. 
for many, even the inquisitive, this is the extent of the knowledge one may obtain about the Delac. However, owing to a rather helpful and expeditious source one has recently come into contact with, your most humble servant is prepared to commit to record several interesting elements, one is hitherto unsure, have been committed to the annals of imperial history in any official format. Necromunda is, after all, merely one hive world. However infamous it may be, it is one amongst a heaving mass of many such planets. Nevertheless, this should not mean it is bereft of scrutiny. In its tale, we oft find the Imperium and the galaxy in microcosm, with all its great and terrible mysteries. One such mystery is the means by which the Delac communicate. It is common knowledge amongst those that treat and deal with them throughout the Underhive that they can do so non-verbally. Seemingly with a look, they can communicate all that is needed, and are apparently able to draw others of their kind to their location without an obvious means of summoning, verbal or technological. It has, as previously mentioned, led to many of those within the Hive, and many of their rival clan houses, to conclude that all of the Delac must be psychers. One can reveal that this is both truth and untruth. It is verifiable that the curse of the psyker presents quite routinely in House Delac. At least one report submitted by interrogators of the Holy Ordos of the Imperial Inquisition has blamed this upon their exposure to and the dealing and cultivation of the narcotic ghast, while yet others still insist, without evidence, that it is something within their heritage that has led to the emergence of so many psychers. However, most of the House of Shadows are not what the Imperium would, strictly speaking, classify as psychers. One would imagine that, if they had been, the entire house would have been scooped up by the black ships millennia ago. Rather, all Delac share a connection that comes from their exposure to a shared consciousness, known to the clan house as the Psychoterica. According to one source, even amongst the clan house, the precise genesis of the Psychoterica is enigmatic. Seemingly held within ancient lithic structures, varyingly recovered from the ash wastes or dredged from the toxic depths of the sump, the Psychoterica is a psychic echo that produces profound physical and mental changes upon the Delac that are presented to it. It is said that unto their minds come memories, ancient beyond reckoning, altering their thoughts, their very selves, and gifting them with a new, grand purpose. In effect, those who have been exposed to the Psychoterica share a gestalt consciousness, a rudimentary hive mind. This is not as evolved or precise as the psychomagic known as telepathy, nor as invasive or as detectable. I am sure theories will abound as to the reasons the Delac have not, as one has mentioned, been delivered en masse to the black ships. One must remind one's acolytes that, as always, those with means in this world escape its laws. Often, one simply has to have the right coin, the right information, or the right friends to slip between the rules that govern the rest of us, and the subtle touch to know not to do so too brazenly. House Delac has all three in plentiful supply, and the ken with which to apply them. As those acolytes amongst you who have grasped the concept of the Psychoterica may have already figured out, the Gestalt provides the Delac with significant advantages over outsiders. While a member of a rival clan house has no idea what rank or station the Delac they have encountered may hold, the Delac themselves have no such trouble. The Psychoterica provides them an instant realization of how strongly each of themselves are connected to the hive mind, providing the clan house a means of ignoring the complex hierarchies, titles, and ranks their other contemporaries are renowned for burying themselves under. 
they all know precisely who their masters are, gravitating towards them instinctually. This also makes internal conflict between the Delac extremely vicious. If the clan house wishes to hunt down a Delac for crimes committed against them, then they wield the force of the Psychoterica against the guilty party, finding their location without fail and attacking without remorse. One may ask quite how such a collective can even be led. Surely the many voices will simply drown each other out. Fundamental to the command of House Delac is the Star Chamber. The name is an open secret. Many who hear it believe they have cunningly unearthed the great truth about the house. This is not the case. All who learn the term often believe it to be quite literal, a physical space wherein the command and control of the House of Shadows resides. It is not. The Star Chamber is a group, akin to the nobility of the other clan houses. They are individuals amongst the Delac who by virtue of birth, skill, or politicking wield greater power than others. The Psychoterica links the Delac, yes, but it does not do so equally. Connection to it is not evenly distributed. Some Delac are bonded to it far more closely than others, and they wield that power accordingly. The ability to do so grants them membership within the Star Chamber and the right to rule within the Clan House. Yet for all this, the Star Chamber is not merely an aristocracy. The connection to the Psychoterica grants them a greater purpose. Should one's acolytes be at a level of scholarship one expects, the threads throughout this record should have connected themselves at this juncture. The stone carvings brought up from the depths of the world that brought unto the Delac the Psychoterica are the creations of the original aquatic sentience of Necromunda, their great sleeping gods, and the plan to save them from the death of the oceans. By the evidence provided by one source, it would seem the outlandish tales of the Delac's origins are not the dreams of barstool stupors. They are terribly and dreadfully real. The Psychoterica is a gestalt born of unfathomable technology crafted in the deep darkness of Necromundan prehistory, by beings wholly removed from the justice of the human form and mind. It has inculcated itself within the Delac, transforming them in mind and body into something inhuman, their minds restructured to accommodate the memories of an ancient alien race and to better conduct the will of dreaming gods that lie deep down below. The Silent Ones are real, it would appear, awfully, abominably real, and the Star Chamber is their voice and their hand. Through the members of the Delac nobility and the collective power of the Psychoterica, the ancient will of these sleeping beast beings is comprehended or so it is believed. In reality, one's source attests, the Psychoterica is inscrutable and imprecise, its technology meant to function with brain patterns and chemistries utterly removed from humanity. It is believed that the dreams of the powerful Delac mix with the memories and biddings of the Silent Ones, both facets of the Gestalt waxing and waning becoming intermingled, creating something beyond human and yet terribly human at the same time. Across the Underhive can sometimes be found fragments of the house's so-called dark tongue, an inscrutable language used amongst them whenever they feel the need to verbally sound out something. The phrase Chu Han Relega Nis Chu Luaris has appeared in dark corners of the underhive of House Primus, and is verifiable that it is one of the few vocalizations heard when the Delac themselves greet each other. The best translation available, based on loan words, linguistic patterns, and several contacts within the underhive, approximates it to the deathless sleeper waits beneath the dead world. A promise? A threat? 
a dreadful covenant? Only the Delac themselves may know. And what it foretends for Necromunda, or the Imperium, one shudders to think. Until such a time as I may return to the curious happenings of the world of Necromunda, Ave Imperator, Gloria in Excelsis Terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash Oculus Imperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.